All right. Thank you everyone for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started for this month's webinar. I'd like to introduce Elizabeth. She's going to be speaking on land use considerations and a very, very popular topic of solar development. So Elizabeth, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you. And I'm also here today with Paul Geringer. Um, he's a co-PI on these projects and um, a helpful legal resource um, for any of those with more legal questions. Uh, start with some slides on uh, that we at the University of Maryland do not discriminate. And if you need any accommodations, they are there for you. There's this video, it might be loud. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. This institution. Oh, no, we don't need to hear that again. Um, awesome. So who we are, again, uh, my name is Elizabeth Thelmany. I'm in the Department of Ag and Resource Economics here at the University of Maryland. Uh, I'm based out of College Park, and I have a background of ag econ. I got my degree here at University of Maryland, as well as a master's in uh, geospatial information sciences, just a fancy word of saying I like data and I like making maps. Um, and so I try to kind of blend that, and you might see that this is a good research topic to understand uh, both data, maps, and um, some economics. We are also a part of the Ag Law Education Initiative, so ALEI. If you are not familiar with us, uh, we are across the three campuses um, listed here, and we are, um, I support the legal experts, so Paul uh, having a law degree, I do not have a law degree, but I like to do um, the data and other research support for the lawyers. More on uh, ALEI. And then for today, uh, we're going to go over why we're looking at um, large scale solar in the state, um, renewable energy, Maryland's energy landscape, uh, the different types of solar, utility scale solar, um, how that's impacting land use and some takeaways for landowners, and then the economics of it all. And hopefully we'll share some useful resources. Uh, again, context and motivation here. So there's an arising land use conflict. Um, I actually come from Colorado. So when I come to Maryland and I hear we wanna put a lot of solar on the ground, I'm always like, wow, we don't even have that much area to put solar on. And we have a lot of people and a bunch of industries. And so uh, we have very limited land in the state and we're trying to do a lot of different things with that land. So naturally um, there can be some conflicts there with development and then ag or uh, more rural lands, then um, that can impact agriculture, the ag industry in the state. Um, agriculture is still Maryland's number one industry. Um, and so how do we continue to support agriculture while also trying to uh, increase renewable energy capa uh, generation capacity in the state? And so I'm really here to try to provide current, um, up-to-date, objective data on utility scale solar, where it is, um, and so that landowners can make more informed decisions and then policymakers can kind of keep up with what's going on um, on the ground in the state. Thank you to our funders. So we have a Northeast grant that's helping me do some of this extension outreach. And then we also have uh, a NIFA grant working on, or NIFA helping support us as we do the research that um, kind of propelled us to really get into the nitty gritty. Um, and so we work with Cornell and Oklahoma State on that grant. Also disclaimer, so we will be talking about some things um, that are legal in nature and um, some things that lawyers and other things that people have said, um, but we're not giving you legal advice. And we're also not trying to market, sell, advocate for any specific energy, renewable energy, or so, uh, solar technology. So really trying to come at this from an unbiased, factual um, place and not to uh, convince you one way or another, just what's actually happening. With all that said, um, I also um, have borrowed some slides from uh, Dr. Drew Chavon. He is our energy uh, extension specialist for this day. He's based out of Western Maryland. Uh, he has an amazing curriculum. I'm actually reviewing it for him currently, so I know it's good because I've been digging into the weeds with it. 
um, that goes over a lot of the technical um, aspects of renewable energy. Like if you have a barn and you want to put some panels on the barn to offset some of your energy use on your farm or for your house or your hobby garden, um, he has a lot, uh, he has like a PhD in engineering. So he comes from a much more technical background. Um, and so that's something that we don't delve into. And so um, if you're looking for more of those specific resources, he has a whole YouTube page and an online course curriculum he developed during like the end of COVID and whatnot. Get into the meat of today's topic. So um, as many of you may know, uh, in general, for our for the entire United States, um, electricity generation um, has increased over time. It's kind of flattened out a bit. Um, and in this left uh, image on the left, you can see the different types of sources to produce energy. So notably coal has gone down um, and to make up for that, there's been more natural gas, nuclear stayed about the same um, and renewables have steadily grown um, over the last 50 years. Um, and then we've seen less petroleum based oil based energy generation. On the right here, for that sliver of renewables, what are the renewables? Um, so we've had hydroelectric um, remain strong and steady for, again, this is for the entire country, um, but more in like the last 10, 15 years, we've seen a lot more of that solar and wind take off. So there's a little bit of geothermal, there's some biomass, but it's really coming from wind and then solar in more recent years. So that's why we have these there for you. And then, um, another, like diving more into specifically solar, um, you can see that solar um, energy generation, again, for the entire country has really grown um, over the last 10 years or so. This also breaks it out, it might be too small, but um, we'll definitely show these slides as well. Residentials that orange, non-residentials that purple, and then what we'll really be focused on today is utility. So this is the large, lots of area, ground mounted solar, and so that's really um, grown a lot more in recent years, again, nationally. Now for Maryland, um, we have two figures here. On the left here for generation, um, one big takeaway from this is that Maryland is a net consumer of energy. So we consume a lot more energy uh, than we produce as a state. And so that's the first big takeaway. The other takeaway is that we do have the nuclear electric power plant Calvert Cliffs, and then we have um, some coal still left in Western Maryland. But then we import a lot of natural gas and crude oil to, for most of our energy needs. A lot of this comes from industry and we'll get over there in a second. And then we also are actually using more renewables than we're producing right now. And so a lot of these goals that are coming from the state and investments are to make it so that Maryland is not only consuming less um, fossil fuel based energy sources, but also so that we're keeping up with our renewable energy demands. Over here on usage, you can see by industry um, how um, our energy is being used. So we have a lot of residential, about um, a little under a third. Then we have over a third is transportation. So um, any, this takes in, into account um, like car mileage and uh, shipping and airplanes and trains and all that, and a bit of industrial. So um, this really shows that it's kind of individual households and consumers that are using a lot of energy um, and less so industrial than compared to other states. So it's important to understand how we use energy if we're going to start making more energy in the state. And feel free to put questions in a little bit. We can kind of do them by sections um, if you need me to clarify anything. Uh, so then again with Maryland honing in from here is that over the last 10 years, um, this is uh, installations per year. So this is not cumulative. That's why you kind of see the back and forth. So there's years that we put a lot of solar in and years we don't as much. But overall the trend is that we're putting in a lot of solar um, and it's been residential, but we're starting to see more of that utility and community scale solar that's ground-based and takes up more land. So the array of solar systems. 
Um, there's the roof mounted systems that go on houses or businesses. A lot of that is to offset energy within that building or household. Uh, you can also see in the example industrial, this is the Ikea parking lot in College Park. And so uh, they provide EV chargers, but they also as a company are trying to do more renewable energy and sustainable things. So uh, that goes to offset like the lights and air conditioning and so forth within that Ikea store. Um, so this is its own industrial system. The energy being generated is going straight into that business. Then we have ground mounted systems where the pole is going into the ground. It's usually trying to maximize how much energy can be generated from that land. And so um, it's really main feature is just to grow or not grow, harvest solar. Um, so they like to use some of these farming terminologies with um, solar production. And then we have co-location dual use. Um, so this I believe is in Germany or Spain in Europe. And so those are grapevines under panels. So they're spaced out and high enough that you can get to the grapes and the fruit, and then also um, allows enough sun for the plants to continue to grow. And then community solar is, again, usually ground mounted, um, but on a smaller scale than utility scale. There are a few systems in Maryland that are on roofs, but it's much more common to see them on grounds, on the ground. Um, more specifically, so this varies by state, um, the definition between community and utility and so forth, and they might have different terms for it. Um, so for community solar in Maryland, these are um, kind of the standards um, definitions. So uh, we have a specific goal of um, having communities, especially disadvantaged communities, engage in getting renewable energy for their um, needs. And so that's what this is about. Then um, again, they're usually, I would say less than like 10 acres. Um, and so they're gonna be smaller systems and that energy is going right back. The best way to think of it is like a neighborhood, like a suburb and your neighborhood wants to offset their energy. And so they have a community solar project next to the neighborhood. And so energy used in that neighborhood is being offset by a community system um, and the next system would be utility solar, um, utility scale. And so for Maryland, we have the most significant solar specific carve out of any state. Last time I checked, could have changed by now, but um, to generate energy that goes back into the grid. So again, community scale is you're going back into a neighborhood, you're going back into a business. It's not going into the entire grid infrastructure for the entire state. Um, so if you're producing energy in Comico County, it's not going to end up in Somerset County. Um, it would really probably end up just being in that county in a smaller town or region. Um, and then utility scale solar is it's like a factory and that energy being generated on that land is going into the entire grid. So for us, PJM um, and that goes through power purchase agreements. This also requires um, the Public Service Commission, PSC, um, to go through the Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity, uh, so the CPCN process, uh, to actually be approved and then be connected to the grid. Um, and so that's the biggest difference between community and utility scale solar is that there is much more regulatory requirements for utility. So I try to make this table to simplify um, the difference between utility scale and community solar um, and yeah, another thing about community solar is it's subscribers only so that um, business or that neighborhood is subscribing into that system instead of technically anyone living in Maryland could just end up with utility scale solar as part of their energy um, without having to specify or subscribe to it. Um, again, they can get up to hundreds of acres compared to community solar being smaller and usually utilities, well, utility scale solar is always ground mounted community solar is still usually ground on it, but it could actually not, it could be on top of roofs and whatnot. Um, utility scale solar is more likely to be in rural areas and community solar is more likely to be close or adjacent to towns or neighborhoods. Um, yeah, and so going, going forward, we're really talking about utility scale solar. We have started doing more research and data analysis on community solar, but um, utility is our focus because it takes up the most land and it has the most data available. Um, this is the process to get approved. This is the same process that um, a natural gas facility 
um, would have to go through or Baltimore's trash incinerator when it got approved, it would have had to go through the same process. They're really treating these solar utility scale solar facilities as an energy generation like factory. Um, and so there's a lots of steps. It takes multiple years. It's pretty costly to the company, uh, requires a lot of state resources. I believe there's about 70 projects. There's been a lot coming through um, and being proposed this year. So it's been harder to keep up, uh, but there's been about 70 projects. And the, the first one was I think 2011. So in the last 13 years, 70 projects. So um, not all of these are being built, but have been through the queue or proposed. Um, attracted land characteristics for this large utility scale solar, it's flat, there's not a lot of obstructions to dig out or clear. Um, it's dry and accessible by uh, public infrastructure, like roads and so forth. Um, and the biggest thing that differentiates one flat undeveloped piece of land from another is just that proximity to the transmission line, a uh, high voltage transmission line. So if, for example, your neighbor has gotten a really attractive offer from multiple companies and you haven't, um, that's probably the biggest reason is just Again, they're really only building along these transmission lines because if they had to build the capacity to take the energy from a field further, that's expensive. Um, and so really these companies are just trying to cushion the bottom lines and make the most money. Uh, and that's why we're seeing solar kind of developed where we are in the state and for the entire country. Wrong way. So I'm gonna go into some of our like analysis and research. I put this up here because um, we did focus groups with attorneys and landowners in New York and Maryland, and we've started uh, synthesizing some of that data. And I have this uh, screenshot of, if you remember during COVID, uh, when we were all learning how to do Zoom, I, if you remember this uh, funny time when a lawyer did not know how to turn off this cat filter in Zoom. Um, and so it was kind of similar to that, working with attorneys. Uh, <laughs> and going back and watching these focus groups. Uh, so these are just some quotes to get us like started. Uh, so we have this um, licensed female attorney in both Maryland and Arizona. Um, and I think this is a great quote to just explain that um, it takes a lot of different expertise in both law and other sciences to understand what's going on with large scale renewables in the country. Um, and that can be a really interesting topic and something to uh, research into and figure out. Um, and then this Maryland landowner opinion is just um, a good frame of reference for why we've really dug into this research the way we have is providing that factual information coming from the university and the extension system of, we're not trying to sway you either way. We're just trying to give you something to base your decisions off of. That's not a company or something online that we don't know where it came from. Um, so data from attorney focus groups, this first table here is we do get a lot of questions of how much per acre per year are we seeing? Cause we are mostly seeing um, rental or the lease agreements are usually in dollars per acre per year. We've seen a few other more creative clauses but this has really become the norm. Um, we haven't seen anything too different for utility scale solar in the last few years. Um, and so you can see there's a really wide variation from like $500 to $4,000 from attorneys. Um, and they kind of, there's some things to specify maybe why that's um, the difference. And these come from different people. But like, for example, that closer in New York City where a lot of energy is being used that um, generates more profit and that land is more competitive for other developments. And then... Uh, length of time and commitment. So these are really long-term leases that we're seeing. Um, and so there's different um, different time parameters on these, but we would say in Maryland, um, we did end up interviewing more people outside of Maryland for the attorneys, but that, that 20 to 40 year is what we're seeing. And then these different renewal clauses and different um, ways of if the panels are still producing or if we want to replace those panels, how can we um, keep the uh, solar generation occurring? Um, then from, we also had landowner focus groups. These are different um, uh, sessions. And so 
Uh, we also got data from them on what they're seeing for rental rates, uh, dollar per acre per year. Um, and so you can see that again, that a thousand dollars is like the minimum. Um, and then if anything, we're going up from a thousand dollars. Uh, so one thing is like seeing what the landowners and the attorneys are saying. Um, and then we also have their lease length and number of years. So um, these like smaller years are usually option periods. So that's when a utility scale solar company is a developer is coming in and really assessing your land and is interested in getting you engaged in the CPCN process of getting approved, but they don't want to do like a full 30 year, 20 year contract until they can actually get through the process. So that's kind of where the option period starts. And then we see those longer lease terms afterwards. And then financing rates. Um, uh, again, there's, we talked to at least like 30 different individuals in these uh, landowner focus groups in different states, mostly New York and Maryland. And um, we heard a lot of different stories of, you know, in this case with this option period. So we're just trying to provide clean data so you can't um, try to get back to any individual of um, what others have heard and seen. Uh, in general, leasing considerations, have your team, uh, an attorney, accountant, insurance carrier, um, family or close friends you trust to talk to um, about these options, and then your lenders, if you are still uh, paying off your land and so forth. Stages of the contract, as I was mentioning before, so there's a letter of intent. This is where you get something in the mail, and it's someone really wants your property, and if you know, it's something you end up having to sign, but uh, that you, you, they are interested in looking and assessing your property. Then there's the option to lease. Again, this is usually during that, um, while you're in the approval process so that they don't have to sign the full like solar lease that's for a longer time period until they know that they are approved to build the solar. Um, and then the solar lease, um, and then the term length again, it, it's, it's varies by stage and, um, we are seeing probably on average of 20 to 30 years once you get to the solar lease past the option period for these with different renewal clauses um, in the contract. I don't know if Paul, our lawyer, wants to add anything specific before I move away from the law phase slides. We can also ask him later. Um, and then Maryland decommissioning plan. So decommissioning is the removal and the the idea of bringing the land back to what it was before you installed um, solar in this case or any other um, development. And so nationally, there it varies state by state and there's no national uh, like standard or regulation. Um, there's also not a lot of um, basis for research of how decommissioning works for solar because the technology is still relatively new. There's not a lot of places where there's been 20 or solar panels installed for 20, 30 years. And so it's kind of one of those things we have to learn as time goes on. Um, it does, it is part of Maryland, for Maryland, it's part of the Public Service Commission's like CPCN process. There's a decommissioning clause. They have to put a bond down um, the development company and um so far, we have not been able to actually get information on how much these decommissioning bonds are from the official process. I know Paul has like talked to a few people and heard some different numbers, but in general, this has actually been redacted or not disclosed to public, like some of this other information we're gleaning. Um, and so, and then another quick thing um, that I should have mentioned earlier is, especially as we've seen more inflation than we have in a while, um, there are uh, increasingly more inflation rates for adjusting the rental rates for these long-term contracts. Um, so we've seen, I would say the average is between like two and 3%. So uh, seeing that increase of your rental rate for your property and these long-term leases increasing slightly each year to kind of keep up with inflation. And then, yeah, sorry, this slide's a little out of order. Um, with decommissioning in Maryland, it's reviewed and updated every five years, these plans to the CPCN or not the C CPCN process by the Public Service Commission. Um, and so we will 
I think the Public Service Commission is kind of learning um, as we go as well, because we again, we don't really know what these panels look like 30 years from now. And so they have this to kind of be like, okay, it's been another five years. How should we address decommissioning for this project now? Great, I'm gonna dig into some of the mapping and um, show you what's going on with solar, large scale solar in Maryland. Uh, I put this little beam of GIS. Uh, again, that's my background. And so um, hopefully some of this is insightful or helpful. Uh, this is an example of a project in, um, this is in Carroll County, Union Bridge. Uh, it's the only built utility scale solar project right now in Carroll County. Um, and there's just some really good images of it. Um, you can see there's like a substation. So again, these um, large scale projects are going right near the energy uh, infrastructure, the energy grid that we already have in this state. Um, and so you can see that this was previous farmland. And then um, a few years later, it's now solar panels. Right now, so the status of utility scale solar projects in Maryland through the CPCM process is um, that we have about a third that are approved to be built but have not been built. Um, and then we have about a quarter pending approval. So they're still in the CPCN process. Um, then we have a little over a quarter that have actually been approved and built. And then we have those that have been withdrawn, denied, um, have not seen any um, updates in like five, six years. So kind of the projects that are no longer. Um, and then my county, so this is the number of projects, utility scale solar projects. Um, so uh, just over half of the counties in Maryland have a built utility scale solar project. So the counties not listed um, do not have utility scale solar. So like Montgomery County doesn't have one. They have some proposed ones. Uh, Howard, uh, those are examples of a few counties that don't. Um, they could still have community solar and other projects, but they just don't have utility scale. Um, and so, yeah, we have the most projects right now that have been built in Dorchester and Queen Anne, so the Eastern Shore, and then approximately 82%, um, so 19 of the 23 counties have proposed or constructed utility scale solar projects. So there's still a few counties out there that have not even had a project proposed. Um, so this map, it's kind of still in the draft form, but you can see um, this is again, the built. So this is area of built utility scale solar. Um, and so Somerset actually right now has the most utility scale solar by area um, constructed in the county. I think it's like 440 acres. Um, and then, you know, counties like Montgomery, Baltimore, Garrett do not have any built yet. Um, and then you can also see there's a lot in Dorchester, um, a lot more is going into Washington and Allegheny and then Charles. Um, so then we, we looked at like the, the data and maps I was just showing you was the actual perimeter of the fencing around solar panels. Um, but there's also these tax parcels of the property owned by someone or an entity. Um, and so before projects are built, we can at least just look at the property records. And so, uh, and this can kind of help forecast where a lot more solar might be going. Um, and so, um, you can see like Garrett County has a lot of property in the CPCM process, uh, Caroline, Allegheny, um, and so even though Somerset has like the most built, uh, there's not as much like proposed uh, acres of actual property in the process. Um, for the actual land under utility scale solar, I use USDA's National Ag Statistics Services. Um, they have a cropscape layer, so where they estimate with both like the census and surveys that farmers fill out but also with um, some satellite imagery of what crops are on the ground. So again, the first project was built uh, in 2011. So I looked back to 2009, 2010 to estimate what land was under what is now developed in two panels. That's why it says 2009, 2010, wanted to see what the land was doing before installed into panels. Um, you can see that in Maryland, that's 80% commercial cropping. Um, in total, there's just under 2,000 acres of utility scale solar 
in the state. Um, and about, I have to pull up the statistic, but I believe it is 90% is cropping systems, just under 90%. So that would be right now about 1,750 acres of cropland under solar. This is as of like May, like last month using satellite imagery and whatnot. Um, and so you can still see that there's some natural spaces developed um, and some forested land that has been converted into utility scale solar. But again, that majority is I land in the state. Um, and so I have been able to update these figures, which is nice, but um, the trend still continues of, uh, yeah, seeing a lot of agricultural land going into utility scale solar in the state. Um, so why, if like the ag industry doesn't want to see a lot of land going into solar in the state, why is there land going into, um, why is there farmland? Why are farmers deciding to uh, lease their land for large scale solar developments? Um, I, so I did a, a rudimentary cost benefit analysis. So I took those rental rate estimates that we heard from attorneys and landowners, and then I compared them to our uh, crop budgets that Shannon and others uh, spend a lot of time working on each year. Uh, so I estimated how what um, the net takeaway profit for a traditional corn soybean rotation would could earn, depending on how well the year is going, versus how much could be offered in a utility scale solar contract per dollar per acre, uh, or dollar per acre per year, and so. A really like a and this is the only thing that's not included is the land cost. So if you own your land or if you're renting land or you're still paying off your land, that land cost is not factored into this because um, we assume that to be the same for now between farming and utility scale solar for the landowner. Um, so in a not so good year, you might see $150 uh, per acre for uh, a, com a traditional commodity harvest. Um, whereas for a utility scale solar contract, we're seeing like a minimum of $500 per acre per year, upwards of $2,000. And if anything, it's going up since we've done this analysis. And so I have this circle because this is the median value across like 10 years for cropping budgets. And then of the values we heard from uh, landowners and attorneys. And so if anything, you're probably going to see at least a 300% increase in dollar per acre per year, dollar per acre per year, um, by engaging in utility scale solar contract over farming. Again, we're not trying to sell anything. We are just trying to explain, especially to people who are not as familiar with farming and they're asking these questions of why are farmers renting their land into solar? Uh, at the end of the day, a rational business mind would, economic agent would choose the higher rental rate. Um, and so that's why even if, as a whole, the ag community in Maryland might be concerned with uh, these large scale renewable energy competing for land, but that individual farmers are still choosing as individuals to lease their land. Again, utility scale solar and farmland are competing for land in Maryland uh, with current market conditions and policy conditions, solar is commonly being chosen over um, when being offered over uh, the commodity cropping systems. So closing out here, uh, I bring back up the CPCM process in Maryland because what can an individual do who has an opinion? Um, you can engage in the public comment hearing. So part of this process requires at least one, it's really more now two. And since COVID, there's always an online option. So you don't even have to physically go to these locations to participate, to have your voice heard. Um, and so that is a great way to, uh, you know, voice your opinion and participate in the process. Also like to remind people that they um, do have a political influence um, in some of these cases and so voting. Um, and if you're ever curious of your state representatives or representatives you might not think about as often, uh, there's some really great resources from Maryland General Assembly um, and again, when you get these slides, these are linked so you can click and then type in your address and it will pull up all of your representatives.
And then additional resources and tools to keep updated. Again, what I mentioned with Dr. Chavon's resources, um, there is something from the Power Plant Research um, Group from the Department of Natural Resources within Maryland that is trying to keep track of all of these different renewable energy sources. And they also have some of the zoning regulations that impact large scale renewables. And then um, this is a national database, especially if you're interested in what other states are doing and where renewable energy is. Uh, anything over one megawatt hour before 2022 is in this database that was produced from the National Renewable Energy Lab, which is under the Department of Energy. So I'm saying these acronyms and these names, so you know that they're coming from trusted um, vetted resources. They're not just, you know, what some industry person is saying. Um, and I am also still currently developing a web tool. So we have the updated data and now we're just making it into a more user-friendly platform. Um, and we're also gonna be doing a webinar series that gets into much more of the weeds and nitty gritty and having some conversations with each other. So we've done the in-person ones and now we're gonna be doing some webinar versions of them. So if you're interested in participating, uh, you can just fill out this Google form that says you want information if, um, about some of these upcoming resources and workshops. And then I think we did it. So, um, stay under 40 minutes and hopefully <laughs> uh, didn't try to put too much information into your lunch hour. But um, if you guys have any questions, comments, um, here to answer and also have Paul. Great, any questions for Elizabeth? And um, this is ongoing research. Um, we're trying to keep it as relevant as possible to landowners and producers in Maryland. So uh, if there's anything you want us to like, focus on or have any topics or themes that would be um, beneficial, I'll also take those. I do have a question. Um, I am, it's not me, but I do have a farm in Montgomery County, but I have a, also a friend who is trying to get a um, solar installation started for community solar on his farmland in Montgomery County. And he is having a lot of, especially community roadblocks. Um, so I don't know wh where do, is there any way, what do we do in those kinds of situations? What does the, I guess my question really is why is Montgomery County being not really getting on board with this kind of stuff? Um. And Paul can add on as well, but uh, I would say the biggest thing that we're hearing is like NIMBYism. Um, so we want cleaner energy, but we don't want it to, you know, a lot of people um, in like Montgomery and Arundel, parts of Howard PG, um, you have a premium that you're paying to live in like less developed areas and to see your rolling hills of farmland and anything that might threaten that um, I I think is what we're seeing um, as a potential issue and what we're hearing. Um, there is a group out of an ENST, the Department of Environmental Science and Technology, that um, is doing community focus groups and outreach specifically in, in Montgomery County about community solar. So if mm -hmm. you are interested, my email is right there and Paul's and mm -hmm. I can um, connect you with them because they are very focused on Montgomery County right now, whereas we're looking very statewide. And if anything, we have right. more of a focus on utility. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Feel free to very reach interested. out. Cool. Very good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording, but please feel free to ask any other questions.